Hi all, welcome to today's session. So today we look at big data. We've already covered the introduction to machine learning. We've already looked at the different kind of machine learning models we can create when dealing with supervised learning tasks. And that is regression tasks and classification tasks. We went ahead and discussed classification tasks in detail. And for classification tasks, we looked at the different ways in which we can evaluate them. And that's using the accuracy score, the precision, the F1 score, and the recall. So today we will shift into big data. And the reason as to why I've gone to the big data part is because we have individuals in here who are doing the BI task. So let's start the introductory part to big data. Hope you can see my screen. And we will start by defining what big data is. So you can think of big data as a collection of data that is huge in volume, yet growing exponentially with time. So it is a data with so large size and complexity that none of traditional data management tools can store it or process it efficiently. So we know that, for example, Excel usually has a data limit. So if you go past 1 million rows, you will have issues visualizing the whole data. And when it comes to Python, we also have memory issues when we are dealing with pandas. So we have to come up with ways in which we can solve these issues. And when dealing with big data, so the most commonly used tool to handle big data is BigQuery and not BigQuery as a whole. So we use SQL to handle big data. Already you've covered SQL, but in this section of the course, I'll show you how you use SQL if you don't have a database so if you just have your raw csv files or your raw data files that are big in size i'll show you how you can handle those big data files using python and sql okay so let's proceed so we've known what big data is so what is an example of big data so if we I'll give you a real world example. So if you open Twitter, if we go to Twitter, or maybe we can call it X now. So we have posts that are coming in each and every second. So I'll close it. I don't want us to look at that that much. And if we, so Twitter is one example. So if we open maybe the Safaricom website, and maybe check the Safaricom transactions. So things like this. So we have like M-Pesa transactions happening each and every second. So there is someone now who is purchasing something on the internet. And if we look at something like the stock market data, so what we have here, for example, so we have data coming in every second, whereby, for example, if I open the one minute chart here, we have data that is coming in for each and every minute that we have here. So how would you store this data efficiently? Because, for example, in the last one hour, for each minute that we are looking at here, we have 60 data points. What about the last one year? So how many data points will we have? So we will have lots of data points that we are dealing with, okay? So these are just some basic examples of the data points that we have and data points that we consider as big data. So we can look at examples that are written here. So the New York Stock Exchange is an example of big data. So basically what I've shown you and data that is generated in the New York 
stock exchange is about one terabyte per trading day so that is quite big okay and then we have social media data so the statistics show that 500 plus terabytes of new data get ingested into the databases of social media sites so for example facebook every day so this data is mainly generated in terms of photo video uploads messages and then comments and uh, our last example will be the jet engine which can generate 10 plus terabytes of data each 30 minute of flight okay so that's just an example of big data another thing we can look at is the types of big data that we have so we have structured data so if you see from the definition of structured so this is data that has a structure so we have columns and these columns have names that we can easily understand so for example if you check a bank transaction you will be able to like know who's the sender who's the receiver and the amount that was paid and the time that this transaction was made and then we have unstructured data unstructured data this is data that you cannot like extract meaning from it like immediately so you'd have to process this data further for you to like get meaning from this data then semi-structured this is a combination of both structured and unstructured whereby you won't struggle to like extract details from this data because what you will be seeing will be somehow structured whereby you can understand a few things from this data so we'll get to see some examples so let's go through the theory that is over here so structured data so any data that can be stored assessed and processed in the form of a fixed format is termed as a structured data over the period of time talent in computer science has achieved greater success in developing techniques for working with such kind of data where the format is well known is in advance and also deriving value out of it however nowadays we are foreseeing issues when a size of such data grows to a huge extent, typical sizes are being in the range of multiple zettabytes. Then we have unstructured data. So any data with an unknown form or structure is classified as unstructured data. In addition to the size being huge, unstructured data poses multiple challenges in terms of its processing for deriving value out of it. So a typical example of unstructured data is a heterogeneous data source containing a combination of simple text files, images and videos. So if you if someone shared with you a YouTube video, so how would you group that YouTube video? So it's unstructured cause how would you analyze a YouTube video? Yeah, so you know that what has been shared with you is data, but how would you analyze that video? So those are some of the challenges that you have there. So nowadays, organizations have wealth of data available with them, but unfortunately, they don't know how to derive value out of it since this data is in its raw form or unstructured format. So we can go to the next slide. So we have semi-structured data. So semi-structured data can contain both the forms of data. So we can see semi-structured data as a structured in form but it is actually not defined with eg a table definition like for example in a database so example of a semi-structured data is a data represented in an xml file so we can head over to google and see maybe how an xml file looks like so it's close to what we have as html files so this is what we have so if i open this image just a minute so if i maybe open this image you can see here there are a few things that we can get to see from this image so at first you won't understand what you have here and that's the unstructured concept of xml files but if you read this 
this data that is in here in detail you'll get to like understand what is happening so for example up here you'll get to see that this is student and the id of this student is id number one then we have the first name of this student being greg last name being dean then certificate the certificate was given to this student because we have true here then module one he attained a score of 70 module two he attained a score of 80 module three he attained a score of 90. and then you will see here we have student with id number two first name of the student last name then the certificate and then the scores so that's how an xml file looks like so you won't be able to like understand what is in the file at first but if you read what you have in here slowly you'll get to understand what we have there inside the files okay so let's proceed on then we have the characteristics of big data so we have the volume so it comes in big sizes we have variety we have velocity and we have variability so what do all those represent so volume the name big data itself is related to a size which is enormous so size of data plays a very crucial role in determining value out of data also whether a particular data can actually be considered as big data or not is dependent is dependent upon the volume of data hence volume is one characteristic which needs to be considered while dealing with big data solutions so you can't tell me like a, a 10 mb file won't be considered to be big data but files that are maybe one gigabyte in size and above can be considered to be maybe big data files okay then variety so refers to the heterogeneous sources and the nature of data both structured and unstructured so during earlier days spreadsheets and databases were the only source of data considered by most of the applications so nowadays data is in the form of emails photos videos monitoring devices pdf audio etc so for example if we look at chat gpt today so chat gpt can take in pdfs and chat gpt can extract info from those pdfs there are there are tools like leonardo.ai whereby you can upload photos and the ai tools that are there can maybe enhance that photo for you or maybe do some changes to that photo depending on what kind of thing you need so yeah that's what we have for variety so this variety of unstructured data poses certain issues for storage mining and analyzing this data so for example if we look at youtube videos so there is a way in which we can analyze them like youtube nowadays has a way of telling you which parts of the videos have been watched much as compared to the other parts but the amounts of resources that you need to like do this are many and maybe most of us don't even have the resources that we need to like handle big data then we have velocity the term velocity refers to the speed of generation of data so how fast the data is generated and processed to meet the demands determines real potential in the data so if you have data coming in fast so which kind of tools will you use to like process these data fast as it as it comes in and how will you be able to like present these data to maybe stakeholders that need to see what is happening okay so you will need to work with big data tools so tools that can process this data for you in a well known format and then we have variability so this refers to the inconsistency which can be shown by the data at times thus hampering the process of being able to handle and manage the data effectively so for example during end months safaricom will expect maybe increased transactions or increased transaction numbers because 
we have a lot lots of individuals maybe getting their paychecks and this is the time period whereby many individuals go out to shop okay and maybe pay their bills so in summary what have we discussed so we've discussed the big data definition and i've informed you some of the big data analytics examples then we've looked at the different big data types and lastly we've looked at the characteristics of big data so what i'll do today is i'll give you an introduction to the tool that we will be using for processing our big data so that will be PySpark. So PySpark is a combination of both SQL and so we have this website Apache Spark. So PySpark is a combination of both SQL and Python that allows you to work with big data at faster speeds. And maybe you can be able to like use PySpark to process your data fast. So what we will look at today is just the installation part. So we won't be using our normal collab notebooks, not, not our normal collab notebooks, but we won't be using our Jupyter notebooks cause Icepack is quite big in size. And if you were to install it on your local PC, it will take time and maybe when running PySpark on your local PC, if you don't have like the minimum specs. So for example, for me, my PC has six, 16 gigabytes of RAM and the CPU can go up to three gigahertz. So, and here I'm using a 12th gen Core i7. So if you have something less than a Core i5, then I would recommend you use Colab, which is better. Okay, so what we will do is we will head over to collab dot research dot google dot com. So we will be using this website for our Spark notebooks. And then what I will require you to do is click on new notebook. But I'll share this link with you so you'll check what I did. Click on new notebook and then I'll name these PySpark. Or let me call this big data. May intake. Okay. So once you've launched your collab notebook, so let me zoom in so that you can see my code. The first thing you need to do is you'll need to click on connect to start your runtime session and then after clicking on connect we can go back to the PySpark documentation website and then we can click on getting started okay so after clicking on getting started we have this button here next which shows us how we can install PySpark so to install PySpark so just like we do the normal library installation we simply type in pip install PySpark. So we'll go back to our collab notebooks and then I'll type in a comment here, install PySpark. And then we will have pip install PySpark. And then I can run that. Okay, I'm getting an error here. Let's see if that solves the error. So I've included an exclamation mark before my pip install PySpark code and it's now running. So you can see PySpark is 316 MBs in size. So it will have taken us more time to install it on our local PC as compared to us installing it on Colab because Colab is running online and it's an open source notebook so you can use it anytime you want as long as you are connected to the internet. And the advantage of us using Colab is we have 12.7 gigabytes of RAM and you are also given 107 GB free of disk space. 
and then you can connect collab with your google drive so that's an added plus so i've installed PySpark using this code pip install PySpark. so i'll comment this code out or oh, before i do that i'll give you guys three minutes to maybe create a new collab notebook and then install PySpark. so what we will be looking at today is just the installation part and then maybe how we can instantiate our PySpark session okay so that's what we look at today and then tomorrow we will dive deep into PySpark and see some of the capabilities that PySpark has so three minutes you work on this and then we can proceed okay so we can proceed that should have been easy so my thoughts are maybe what we can do is i can before we proceed on with vice pack i can show you other tools that you can use to process big data and one of the tools that you can use to process big data is bigquery but it's a paid product so for, from google cloud so you can open this part here and then click on try bigquery for free so you can sign up for their free trial but i won't do that because i won't be using bigquery for now so let me check my console and see if there is a way in which i can access bigquery so if i click on console then come here you can see i can get access to bigquery and then if you click on if you check here we have ways in which you can maybe add sources data sources from you can connect data from different sources for example from amazon s3 data transfer from azure you can connect data from all these data sources you can also connect data from google drive another source we can Another source of data we can use is the public data set. And I'll check that. And here, the data that I'll maybe check is the, we have the Bitcoin, Bitcoin cryptocurrency. So I'll check the about COVID-19 data. And then I'll click on view data set. So once I do that, so this that data will be added here. So here we have 
different data tables. So for example, we have this part here, COVID-19 open data, we have compatibility view. So this is a view whereby you can see we have a query here that creates that view. And here we have the COVID-19 open data. If we check the details, you can see the data is 11.71 GB in size. So how would you process this data using Python? knowing that maybe your PC RAM is even below 10 GB. So how would you work with that? Okay, so you need tools that can properly handle SQL to help you process these data. So for example, if I was to explore this data, so if I check the schema, we have, let me check columns that we can work with. So you can see we have all these different columns. So I'm going to pick at least two columns. So I'll pick the country code. So I'll click on query then in new tab. So this is just a demonstration of how you can work with BigQuery. So I'll select country name, then I'll select new confirmed cases. And then, yeah, so that's what I'll do. So if I was to analyze this data and visualize what we have here, so I'll have to do this. So maybe I want to get the average. So we don't have average, maybe count of new confirmed. Let me check how we get the average. So we type in AVG then new confirmed cases from and then we have to group this data by so group by country name and then we can run this so we will get our analysis here in form of a table so instead of us working with all these columns that we have here we are just using a simple sql script here get the average of new cases, new confirmed cases that we had in each country name. And then what I can do is I can give this new column a name as average confirmed. So I'll have to add an underscore here and then I can run that. So after doing that, what can you do? So I can click on explore this data and then I can visualize it using Luca Data Studio. So that's one of the advantage of using BigQuery. But the downside of using BigQuery is you'll have to upgrade. So you have to set up your billing and each query that you run is usually charged. So here you can see I can go ahead and visualize the data that I've explored. So I'm combining BigQuery and look at Data Studio to visualize my data. So here we have the countries and I'm visualizing the countries, the different countries that we have. And what I can do is I can visualize these points that we have here using the average confirmed so size i'll drag the average confirmed there onto size and then i can also add that to the color metric so it's like using w a w version but an online version of it and here you can see the final results that we have here so one thing you will note is when working with this data we've spent quite some less time typing this sql query and then linking our query that we have here with a visualization tool so when working with PySpark, we will be doing something same whereby we will be combining python and sql to analyze our data and make visualizations so 
that's what we will be doing here and the advantage of us using PySpark is it's not a paid product and you will be querying your databases for free or your big data sets for free yeah so i think since you've learned how you can install PySpark we can maybe stop there for today you go and check how BigQuery works and if you've got enough resources you can set up the billing and practice working on BigQuery with open source data sets so for me i usually work on BigQuery on a daily basis so i'm familiar with all the functions that i can run with BigQuery and i can also do visualizations using Luca data studio but we won't be covering these in the course so this is just an example of a tool that we can use to process big data but in this course we will be using PySpark yeah so that's the PySpark installation code so for tomorrow we will proceed on with working with PySpark so you'll get to see how do you instantiate your PySpark session how do you create data views for SQL querying and maybe how do you create machine learning models for big data using PySpark so that's all for today maybe you can ask questions if you have any anyone with a question Anyone with a question? Okay, so I'll stop the class recording there.